do you want to just quickly share your screen? Sure. Um, can you see my slides? Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks for doing that. Just wanted to check. Sure. Okay. Well, it's we're we're now the session's now recording and it's time to start. So welcome everyone, both the presenters and and others that are here to to hear the presentations. Just a quick comment on the format. Um, we're going to do five minute presentations for each of the six papers. Um, and we're just going to do them back to back without any break, without any time for question. And that should leave us about 30 minutes at the end uh, for questions. And of course, then the questions can be for any of the presenters. So I encourage you to, to try to maybe write down any questions you have for, for some, of the, some of the presenters so you don't forget them by the time it gets to the uh, discussion uh, time. So um, with that, we're going to start with um, the first paper um, in, the, in the schedule that's on the ICSI website, which is from our software engineering practice uh, track. So go ahead, Mar uh, Marcos, close yours. Okay. Uh, just uh, can you see my screen? It's working. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcos, uh, and today I'm going to talk about our work on using NLP techniques to improve manual test based descriptions. This work was done in uh, collaboration with uh, Prodigy Education. Uh, so, since uh, software testing remains a manual activity uh, in several industries uh, because of several uh, different challenges, uh, test cases are often described only in natural language. And uh, this is a typical example of a natural language test case. Uh, it, it might have uh, several fields. In this case, you can see uh, it has a name, uh, membership purchase. It might also have an objective. Uh, in this case, it, it, it is to verify that the user can purchase a membership. And it might have one or more steps, which are basically uh, direct instructions that the, that the tester needs to execute to achieve the, the testing goal. In this case, you have uh, three steps. The first one is login with a member account, and then sign up for membership and verify that the user is a member. So this is a typical example of a test case in natural language that we use in our work. And uh, very often those test cases are defined by employees from different departments. You can have uh, employees from QA, from di different development teams, all of them uh, working simultaneously on new test cases. And these ultimately might lead to problematic test case descriptions, such as uh, unclear or ambiguous descriptions, incomplete test cases where you, you might have one or more uh, steps missing, and even redundant test cases. And all of these problems, basically, uh, they might uh, they make the manual testing even more costly to the company. But having employees to manually go through all those new test cases and verify that they are uh, correct, uh, it's just time consuming and it becomes impractical when you have a scenario with a large test suite. So uh, in this work, we propose an automated framework that can analyze and provide feedback on how to improve those natural language test cases. The main component of our framework is the analysis component, which we use to build uh, models to perform different types of analysis to improve test cases. The first module uh, recommends uh, improvements to the terminology of a test case description. Basically go through all the steps and uh, try to improve uh, the terminology. Uh, the second uh, module suggests uh, possibly missing steps in a new test case. And the third module uh, suggests uh, existing test cases that are similar to the new test case. I'm gonna quickly go through each module. So for the first one, it identifies words in a description of a test case that could be replaced by more likely alternatives based on the usage in the previous existing test cases. For example, if a new test case has this step, log into the game with a child account, this module uh, suggests replacing child by either member, non-member, or student account. And you can see that if you have either member or non-member, for example, we're gonna have a more clear step here, which already indicates the type of account that's necessary for the tester for this test case. For this module, we experimented with different statistical and neural language models to provide that kind of recommendation. From the statistical side, we built different uh, n-grams from unigram up to five gram. And from the neural side, we built uh, three different uh, birth-based language models 
uh, either pre-trained, we use the pre-trained model or the fine-tuned model as well. We also experimented with a combination of them and achieved better results uh, with this combination. So basically, if you have a new test case, what we do is we go through each step at a time. And in each step, we have several words. We, we go through one word at a time and mask it. Then you select the appropriated language model based on a set of characteristics that are uh, defined in our paper, that can be found in our paper. And then you get the top K predictions from the model and suggest them if uh, it's necessary for this case. So for the second module, it recommends missing so steps. Marcos, yep. Marcos, just want to warn you, you got about just under a minute left. Okay. Um, so you. for this uh, second module, it suggests missing steps for a new test case based on how the steps appear together in the previous test cases. We used a frequent item set and association rules for this module. And basically, this is an example of a rule that we have. If you have a new test case with these two steps, it suggests to add this go to the membership step just because it appeared together with the other two in the previous test cases. And for the third module, uh, it identifies existing test cases that are similar to a new one. We used text embedding, similarity, and clustering techniques. And all the experiments can be found in our paper that we published last month in the TSC journal. So uh, finally, we integrated our framework to our industry partners uh, infrastructure through a web application. Uh, that can be easily accessed by engineers. The application has adjustable parameters and to provide some flexibility to the user and the recommendations can be automatically applied to a new test case. Uh, so to summarize, I explain how these problems, uh, the existing problems might affect manual testing and how we proposed an automated framework to address, to address this problem. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, Again, as I said, we'll hold questions in, in, until the until the uh, discussion time. So next up from our technical track, we have Li Xin Shu uh, talking about combinatorial testing. So please uh, share your screen and go ahead. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? We can yeah. see you screen. We can see you. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Li Xing from Nanjing University. My talk today is about combinatorial testing of REST for APIs. REST is a popular style for creating web APIs, which has been widely used in modern web service. Developers usually document their web APIs in open API format. We can find the detailed information of operations that can be performed and the input parameters of each operation in its spec. These operations and their input parameters constitute huge and constrained input space. To generate a task case, we need to determine not only the execution orders of operations, but also input parameter value assignments. So we propose the REST. REST CT is systematic because it generates test cases which can cover interactions of a certain number of operations and also interactions of a particular input parameters in every single operation. And REST CT is automatic because no one influence in the whole testing process. And this picture gives an overall overview workflow or REST CT approach. Giving us back as input, REST CT will consider the input space of operations first and generate a sequence coming array to determine the execution orders of operations. The key problem here is to determine the dependency relationships between different operations. REST CT uses the layer relations of resources and the CORD semantics to determine if a simple T-way sequence is constrained satisfying or not. Then the RASCT will apply a grading algorithm to generate a T-way constrained sequence coming array to cover combinations of any T-way operations. The algorithm will generate an operation sequence to cover the most uncovered T-way sequence at one time and repeat the generation until all T-way sequences are covered. 
Once the sequence coming array is obtained, RASTT will then consider the input space of parameters of each operation to determine the uh, concrete input parameter values to execute each operation. In this phase, the key problem is to identify value domain for each input parameter. RASTT adopts four strategies to determine the value domain for each parameter which takes uh, runtime information, domain-specific knowledge, and history information into consideration. Another key problem here is the extraction of constraints from natural language descriptions in the stack. In RustDT, we use NLP to implement a pattern-based approach so that the formal representation of constraints can be automatically extracted based on a set of predefined patterns. Finally, RustDT will generate the HTTP request. The basic idea is to test the required input, input parameters first to ensure a successful execution of the operation, and then add optional parameters into test models to exercise as many surveys behavior as possible. Uh, here we set up two research questions for REST CT. The subject APIs come from GitLab and uh, Bing Maps. In the first RQ, we compared the performance of REST CT against uh, REST. According to the result, we can find that REST CT can test more operation sequence than REST. Also, find more bugs. Uh, and uh, Rust CT run faster than Rust. In the second RQ, we investigate the impact of different coverage strengths applied on the performance of Rust CT. Uh, the result shows that coverage strengthening of operation sequence tends to have a greater impact than others, and the Sorry. coverage strengthening to tends to be the best choice. Sorry for the interruption, but just you have just under a minute left. Um, okay, it's all. Thanks for the listening. <laughs> Guess the interruption was unnecessary. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that. So next up, we have um, uh, Ying Quan Zhao, history-driven test program synthesis. So okay. go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yun Quan Zhao from Tianjin University. In this presentation, I will introduce our work history driving test program synthesis for JVM testing. Uh, the goal of our paper is to generate bug revealing test programs as much as possible. To achieve this goal, uh, we explore the historical bug revealing test program since uh, we think these test programs contain the ingredients facilitating the detection of the bugs. Uh, and we utilize program synthesis to generate new synthesized test programs by combining the ingredients extracted from uh, various historical bug reviewing test programs uh, and put these ingredients into different contexts. Uh, finally, we execute the synthesized test program to cover uh, more instructed uh, JVM's behaviors and, and thus leading to detecting new bugs. Uh, however, to achieve this goal, there are two main uh, challenges remain to be addressed. The first challenge is how to measure and extract ingredients in historical bug revealing test programs. And the second challenge is how to guarantee that the synthesized test program is valid. Uh, to address these two challenges, we propose Java Teller. Uh, Java Teller first initialize seed programs and uh, uh, to form a seed pool at step one and uh, extract code ingredients from historical uh, test program to form an ingredient pool at step two. Uh, then it randomly selects an ingredient and a seed in step three and step four and synthesize them together in step five to generate a new test program. And finally, uh, Java Teller uses this synthesized test program to differentially test the JVMs. If there are inconsistencies in the output of these JVMs, we output the difference report and the following synthesized test program. Uh, otherwise, we put the test program into the seed pool for further synthesis. In particular, uh, Java Teller solved the two challenges in step two and step five 
in the following, I will introduce these two steps. Uh, to make a trade-off between extraction efficiency and effectiveness, we design five types of code ingredients based on the block granularity. Uh, uh, to conduct ingredient extraction, Java Taylor first transforms the test program into a control flow graph uh, based on the Jimpo code and showing in the right. Uh, then it analyzes each code block from top to bottom and records the code ingredients that meet the predefined requirements. For example, based on this control flow graph, we can extract the four ingredients. And after this process was done, an ingredient pool can be built by Java Teller. Uh, the second challenge is to ensure that the synthesized test program is valid, since the uh, uh, original syntactic and semantic constraints of the ingredient may be broken during the synthesized process. For example, if we insert the ingredient composed of line five and line three, in the history test program into a new seed program without any change. The sensor test program must be invalid since uh, it missing some variable definitions. And if the invoked function get count as line five is a protected function, there is also no definition of this function in the sensor test program. Uh, to ensure that the sensor program is valid, we design several strategies to fix the broken constraint for the variable missing its definition. Uh, Java Teller prefer to find whether there is a variable in the seed program that can be uh, used to replace the variable in the ingredient. Uh, if such variable are found, Java Teller replaces the variable in the ingredient with the identified type compatible vari variable in the seed program. Otherwise, Java Teller constructs new definitions for those variables. In this way, we can make the interaction between the ingredient and the seed program stronger. Uh, for the missing of API definitions, Java Teller fixes this uh, broken constraint by changing all the private or protected functions uh, involved in the ingredient to public. Uh, based on the fix fixing strategy in Java Teller, the sensor test program in the previous example can be like this, where Java Teller reuse the uh, uh, seed, uh, seed variable str at line four and uh, creates new variables for usage count and uh, main at line five, six, and seven. Uh, finally, a valid synthesized test program can be generated. Then Java Teller executes it to check whether it can reveal a JVM bug or not. Uh, to evaluate the Java Teller, we adopt the two popular JVMs, then is Hotspot and OpenJ9 and SubJS. And we collect the test programs revealing historical bugs from the hotspot test suite. Uh, uh, the, the, and, and the experimental results demonstrate that the Java Teller can outperform than the uh, state of the art technique. Then is Java Teller can achieve higher JVM code coverage and uh, expose more unique incons in inconsistencies. And the Java Teller had found six unknown bugs that uh, uh, have been fixed by the uh, developers. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you much, Ying Kuan. Um, next up, we have Jin Wu, who's going to talk about uh, FATA test um, in the context of regression testing. Um, so go ahead, share your screen. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, now. can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Today I'll be introducing our recent research work, FADA test, fast and adaptive performance regression testing of dynamic binary translation systems. I'm Jin Wu. My collaborators include Jian Dong, Rili Fang, Wen Zhang, Wen Wen Wang, and De Chengzuo. This is a joint research work by Harbin Institute of Technology at the University of Georgia. Let's first take a look at what dynamic binary translation is. In general, dynamic binary translation, or DBT for short, translates the guest binary code to the host binary code. Here, the guest and the host can be different architectures. For example, with DBT, we can execute native ARM applications on an x86 machine. Thus, DBT can enable many important applications for example, product transition, mobile computation offloading, and so on. However, DBT systems are extremely complex because they need to bridge the semantic gaps between different architectures. 
the translation and emulation also bring significant overhead. Besides, the code base is very large and it is updated very frequently to support more features. So to monitor and maintain the performance of a DBT system, it is necessary to compare the performance before and after each commit, which is known as performance regression testing. Unfortunately, it is not easy to apply frequent performance regression testing for DBT systems. To understand why, let's see how the performance of a DBT system is tested. A widely applied approach is using standard test benchmarks, which are well-designed and the testing results are accepted by the state of the art. However, due to the performance overhead of DBT, using the standard benchmarks for performance testing takes a very long time. Another problem is DBT runs on different hardware platforms, from low-end IoT devices to powerful high-performance servers. So using the same benchmarks for different platforms may lead to either long testing time or inaccurate testing results. To address these difficulties of applying performance regression testing for DBT systems, our idea is generating fast and adaptive test programs by learning from standard benchmarks. This approach first learns the behaviors of standard benchmarks and then reconstructs test programs. Afterwards, these test programs can be used for performance regression testing of DBT systems. Based on this approach, we design a testing framework called FADA test. The first design issue of FADA test is what behaviors to learn. To preserve the characteristics of the original benchmarks, FADA test learns the instruction execution behaviors and the thread activity behaviors. Then FADA test generates test programs by reorganizing code blocks and recovering thread behaviors. Here is an overview of how it works. The first step is profiling the hotness of executed code blocks of the original benchmark. Next, thread activity behaviors are also extracted. And finally, with the above information, FADA test is able to generate more efficient test programs. We also implemented FADA test and conducted an evaluation. Now let's see some results. First, about effectiveness, the curves indicate the performance changes among the versions of a DBT system. As we can see, FADA test produces very similar results to the original tests. Next is the testing efficiency. The speed ups are shown in this figure. We can see significant testing efficiency improvement. To summarize, the performance issues discovered by the long running original benchmarks can also be discovered by FADA test. While the testing efficiency is also improved. This is my presentation and thank you for listening. Thanks, Jim. All right, next up we have Enjiang Wei. Um, so go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I am Enjiang Wei. I'm going to present my work on preempting flaky tests via non item potent outcome tests. This is joint work done by me and my collaborators, Pu, Zhengxi, Tao, Darko, and Wing. We are from Stanford, Peking, Illinois and George Mason University. To begin with, let's see one example of non-item potent outcome test together. The test is, uh, test zero is non-item potent because when you run it twice, it, it passes in the first run but fails in the second because on the second run, the assertion fails for comparing NumPy arrays. After analyzing the failure, we find that the root cause is actually in a function named to zero invoked by the test. The function takes several global variables as arguments and the function to zero modifies the data in a NumPy arrays path in, which are G2 and G3 corresponding to northing and easting 
in this function. The code in red changes those global variables because minus equal is an in-place operator directly modifying the data in a global NumPy array. And our proposed fix can avoid changing those variables by creating new arrays, thus making the arguments and the global variables unchanged when invoking the function. On a high level, our fix avoids the function, function side effect. Developers merge our change and praise us, saying that this is a good change. In order to detect such non-item potent outcome tests, namely NIO tests, we propose three different modes for detection. These three different modes repeat tests at different levels. The isolated method mode repeats a particular test method in each run. If there are three tests, there need to be three runs. The isolated class mode repeats all the tests from a test class in each run. In this example, if there are three tests in total coming from two different classes, in the first run, it runs T1, T1, T2, T2. In the second run, it runs T3, T3. And the entire suite mode repeats all the tests from a test suite, which can finish in one run. The conclusion of our empirical evaluation is that all three modes can detect similar tests. Isolated method can detect the most, and the entire suite mode has the lowest overhead. For the reason why the results of different modes differ, please refer to our paper for details. Then you may be curious why we are interested in detecting and fixing NIO tests. To explain the motivation, I will begin with the definition of flaky tests. A test is flaky if it passes or fails for the same code version. Flaky tests are harmful because they can mislead developers to debug non-existing faults in their recent change and also reduce developers' trust in tests. In many testing frameworks, such as JUnit for Java language, the order of tests is not fixed. Prior work has found that a prominent category of flaky tests are order-dependent tests. There are several notions related with order-dependent tests. Here, test T1 is a victim and T2 is a polluter. If we run T1, T2, then both, te both tests pass. But if we run T2, T1, then T1 will fail. Essentially, victim will fail while run after polluter due to the shared state. In this example, the variable X. Apart from the victims and polluters, there are also latent victims and latent polluters. Latent victims contain assertions that depend on the shared state. And latent polluters are uh, modify the shared state. And latent polluters are a superset of polluters and latent victims are a superset of victims. A latent victim and a latent polluter are latent flaky tests, which means that they are not manifest flaky tests yet because they need to have another test to form a polluter victim pair. Then let's take a look at the example test T5. T5 is an IO because when running T5 twice, it passes in the first run, but fails in the second. Basically, an NIO test self pollutes the state that its own assertions depend on. So it is both a latent polluter and a latent victim at the same time. Prior work has proposed techniques to detect latent polluters and latent victims to preempt flaky tests, but with high false positive rates. And they did not evaluate whether developers actually care about latent polluters and latent victims. In this work, we propose that NIOs are much more worth fixing because they are both latent victims and latent polluters at the same time, much easier to detect with no false positives. Moreover, developers are generally very positive about fixing NIO tests. For all the detected 361 NIO tests, we manually debug each one of them, and we fix 268 of them by opening pull requests. Up to 192 fixes have already been accepted by developers. To sum up, in this paper, we focus on non-item potent outcome tests, which are tests that change from pass to fail when run twice in the same execution environment. We detect and fix NIO tests to preempt order-dependent flaky tests. NIO tests are important because they are in the intersection of latent polluters and latent victims. We detect 361 NIO tests from open source, and a large number of the fixes have already been accepted by developers. Our dataset is publicly available. Thanks for your attention. 
Okay, thank you, Yang. We have one more talk for this session before we get into the discussion time. So that's uh, going to be One Fuzzing Strategy to Rule Them All by Mingyan Wu. So go ahead and share your screen, Mingyan. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, everyone. Today, our presentation is about a powerful fuzzing strategy named Havoc. It is integrated in many fuzzers as before without further illustration. Our target is to investigate the impact of havoc. My name is Mingyuan Wu and I am a joint PhD student from Sustat and the University of Hong Kong, supervised by Professor Yuxin Zhang from Sustat and Professor Herming Choi from the Hong Kong U. A group of fuzzers adopt a random search mechanism named the havoc explicitly or implicitly to augment their edge exploration. The workflow of havoc is so it is bigger. First, we select a seed from the C groupers, then we use Havoc to generate new mutants. Overall, Havoc enables a mechanism, namely mutator stacking. Havoc uses a, a device a stacking size for the applied mutators for each mutation. Accordingly, Havoc randomly selects mutators into the stack. Eventually, all the stack mutators are applied to the C in order to generate a mutant. Note that uh, generally, Havoc enables two types of mutators, chunk mutators and unique mutators. We will introduce their detail later. And if a mutant explores new edges, it will be added into the C groupers for further mutation. Otherwise, it will be discarded. For mutator stacking, it randomly applies multiple mutators from a finite mutator side to a given C. For example, we have a C here, then we use a unique mutators, then we use a chunk mutator to it. By combining the two mutators, we have our final mutant. Mutators defined by Hammer can be categorized into two types. The first one is unit mutators. And unit mutators, it mutate a single bit, byte, or word in a C. And second one is chunk mutators. The chunk mutators mutate undetermined number of consecutive bytes. So Havoc is integrated in the fuzzers in two manners. The first one is sequential manners, and that is to say it runs the major fuzzing strategy first, then runs the Havoc staging, uh, uh, strategy second. And the second one is a parallel manner. It runs the major and Havoc in the same time, and it requires to synchronize the sequence. So since the power of Havoc has not yet been fully explored, we raised our research question. And the first one is, how does Havoc perform on different fathers in terms of its default setup and mechanism? And the second one is, how does Havoc perform on different fathers under diverse setups? So we first introduced multiple fathers in our evaluation. For example, fathers with Havoc and fathers without Havoc. We also introduced the pool Havoc as an independent fathers to evaluation. And we also apply title projects commonly adopted by the original papers of our study fathers. And we have our first finding that applying Havoc by the default setup can significantly improve the edge coverage performance of the study fathers. And the second finding is that Havoc is essentially a powerful fathers. Executing Havoc under one seat without being appended to any fathers for sufficient time can already achieve a superior edge coverage over many existing fathers. The third one is that executing havoc for a long time upon a father can potentially result in stronger edge coverage performance. And when situation comes to diverse setup, the havoc can also achieve a significant performance. And havoc also plays a vital role in exposing program vulnerabilities. And furthermore, applying havoc to different fathers potentially explore rather common edges. It is essential to adopt uh, the selection of the stacking size and mutator types for different projects to optimize their respective edge coverage performance. As a result, we propose half map. Map refers to multi arm bandit. And we select a C from the C groupers as usual. Then we have a stacking size level bandit machine enable seven arms, where each arm is assigned corresponding to a stacking size choice. And we also have uh, mutator type bandits, which is selecting two types of mutators. And first, we uh, determine the stacking side. Then we fill in the stacking with the selecting mutators. And after we have done the all job, we generate a mutant and run it on target program and update the bounding according to the coverage information. Then we also judge whether it explore a new edge or not. If not, it will be discarded. If yes, we use to update our sequence. And we can observe that have map achieve a significant better performance than pure have. On the other hand, executing have a map in three threads can also outperform QC. 
So uh, here's our contribution. We first have an extensive study. We started a performance impact by applying havoc to a set of study fathers on real world benchmarks. And we find that applying havoc can substantially improve edge coverage and crash detection for all the study fathers. And we also have a technical improvement. We propose a lightweight approach havoc math based on our findings, and which can boost the pure havoc and outperform all the study fathers. And we also have a practical guidelines. We highly recommend future research to investigate more powerful techniques for combining habit, concurrent execution, and learn-based fuzzing. Okay, thank you. That will be all. All right, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to spend, I guess it's more like 25 minutes. We're going to spend 25 minutes, uh, and it's just our chance to ask questions of our presenters, but also to uh, to make comments if people have, have comments they want to make. So um, the floor is yours. And those of you that are would rather use the chat, feel free to do that. Oh, it looks like we have one, one in the chat now. Um, maybe I'll just read that out. So this is for Java Taylor. Do you find bugs with patterns which are previously found based on the knowledge learned from historical data? What kinds of new bugs could J Java Taylor find? Uh, 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 we, uh, Java Taylor has find six unknown bugs in total, and we checked the, these bugs and uh, found that all these bugs are uh, can't find uh, by other techniques or historical test programs. Uh, the bugs uh, uh, Java Taylor found are, uh, can divide into uh, uh, crashes and uh, uh, di differences between the different uh, uh, JVMs, such as Hotspot and uh, OpenG9. Uh, they given the same test case, they are throwing different exception messages. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, uh, some some test case test case may uh, result in JIT uh, crashes uh, in the OpenG9 uh, Hotspot. And this, this, this bugs are cannot found in the historical test programs. And we think we put the ingredient into a new context then to generate a new program stat then to trigger this, this bug. So yeah, that's all, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your answer. Uh, Jin Wu, any follow-up? Did that answer your question? Or any more you wanna ask about that? Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you very all much. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I, so I have a follow up question, um, just quickly for about the Java Tater tool. Can you give us an example of a of a of a defect that you found in the in the uh, JVM? Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, I'm just curious what kind of defects yeah. are there. Wait a minute, I open my slides. And and while he looks, Manish, welcome. Manish is our student volunteer, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I joined at five, sorry. So I have running into my technical issues. Yeah. Um, maybe you can help us out by watching the chat, um, Manish. Yeah, yeah th th this is a new bug we found in OpenG9. Uh, uh, it's very simple. Since we uh, assign usage at line five as now, but uh, uh, the impression of OpenG9 about memory usage, uh, they not check the uh, the value of the usage. So uh, this case in hotspot, hotspot will throw in non-point exception, but it can uh, uh, normally execute on OpenG9. So this is the difference about uh, handling exceptions. So we reported to OpenG9 uh, and the, open, uh, the developers of OpenG9, they uh, think this is a difference between uh, the impression of uh, uh, JVMs. So they fix this uh, bug and to makes the behavior consistent with the hotspot. Yeah, this is a very simple example. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate it. No, thank you. Um, so we have a, we have a, a comment by, uh, in the chat here. All authors who worked on finding bugs. How many bugs did you find per month of work? For example, if you found a total of six new bugs while working on the paper for a year, you have 0 0.5 bugs per month. Okay, so that's an interesting question from Darko. 
So authors, do you want to call out your answers? If you, if you know them off the top of your head. Yeah, uh, let me answer uh, to, start, to start. So uh, our technique is to run the test twice. Uh, and uh, actually all the, all the bugs can be found in like two or three days because the technique is to, uh, the technique is simple. You don't need to do like uh, um, uh, generate a lot of tests. It's just running existing tests twice. And uh, and actually, you can parallels parallels it because for for different projects, you can you can run it on different machines, and so it's it's very fast. Yeah. Oh uh, no 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 no! no. <laughs> I mean, the hard the difficulty for this work is to actually debug each test manually because we in in this work we don't have a fully automated technique, and we need to inspect each non-item potent test. Uh, ourselves and uh, that takes a uh, much longer time like several months or half a year several months for several months for how many tests for two uh we have uh sorry we have um we have detected a total of three uh, sorry just a second so you went through 600 wasn't it uh, 600 yeah, yeah three three hundred six uh three hundred and sixty one and i will test okay so it's a lot of work. Um, and now in your case, you're sort of finding bugs with the tests themselves. Yes, yes. As opposed to defects perhaps in the, in the code base under test. Um, it, for your, that's, just, that's just the nature of your work. Yes, we are finding problems in the tests, yes, in the test code, yes. Yeah. And then how, and how many months would you say you spent on those 361? Um, uh, All tests because, that you manually reviewed. Um, for I mean, um, because we have multiple authors and <laughs> we work together, so <laughs> takes like uh, several months. Several months for several people. Yes. Yes. And okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. I, any Any other authors want to want to take a stab at that? Uh, yes. Can I ask a question to other presenter? Just wait. Is this about um, is this about Darko's comment? Uh, are you looking? Uh, are you going to ask a new question? Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask a new question to other. Okay, authors. just wait. Can you hold your thought just for one minute, Mingyang? Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Just wait one minute. Is, is there anyone else who wants to try to answer Darko's question? <laughs> All right. We won't put anyone else on the spot. Mingyang, go ahead with your question. Okay, I have some question uh, for Marcus. Marcus, yes, I, I just uh, just for curiosity, I I just wondering how to evaluate the description, uh, whether the description is better on a data set without label, because you know the test description is somehow human dependent. I think this is better than this one. So if we, if you want to generate a new discussion or a new data set, how to compare in your performance to a state of the art? Um, so in my case, uh, what we wanted to do, if we're talking about the descriptions, uh, we wanted to what we wanted to do is to use the knowledge from the existing test cases to improve any new incoming test case. So that's uh, what we did. So like we cannot really compare. Uh, with other techniques directly or like other results because it's, it depends on the data set, right? But what we did was like to build the models with all the existing test cases. And for any new incoming uh, test case, we would uh, use the model to, to pass the, the test case through the model to make it consistent with what already exists. So what we wanted is to make sure that any new ones, like they use the same terminology. Otherwise you're gonna have like, you, you have several ways of saying the same thing, right? So we wanted to avoid this, so to have a more consistent uh, test suite in terms of the descriptions. Uh, and to evaluate the models, we basically use uh, the usual metrics to evaluate language models, like perplexity. Uh, that's how we evaluate it. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Can I ask another question or uh, try yes, to follow the comment? OK, OK. So I have another question for An Zhang. Yes. So you mentioned. Yeah, you mentioned the existing approaches tend to generate the false positive on NEO. 
So uh, I, I was wondering why, because there are all the static analysis technique and they are trying to analyze the past, which is our cannot, uh, cannot uh, explore in the real runtime. So as a result, they produce more false positive uh, test case on new or other reasons. Thank you. Thanks for a great question. So, so actually, so regarding the false positive, the, the reason is because um, for example, if you have to have latent polluters and uh, uh, prior work uh, called Reliable Testing uh, published at ESTA 20, uh, 2015, their work detects a total of two, uh, 575 latent polluters, but manually filter 381 of them, which are false positive, up to 66%, because those latent polluters cannot reasonably become polluters. Um, the, the, then you may wonder why those latent polluters cannot reasonably become polluters is because they modify some shared state, but that shared state is, um, so it's, it, it's, it's hard for developers to write a test to actually access that shared state. So they change something, but there cannot be a reasonable victim to pair that latent polluter to let the latent polluter become a polluter. You need, you need to have a pair, right? Have a polluter victim pair, but such victim cannot exist. Th then the latent polluter can never become polluters. And the same thing for victim, for latent victim. If you cannot find a reasonable polluter to pair that latent victim to make him become victim, victim then it will, it, it, it will be false positives. And so, can I, that, does my answer, uh, it's, are you are you happy with my answer? Yes, yes, yes. Thank, thank you. you. I, I totally understand. Yeah. Thanks. So if Great. there's no other question, that I still want to ask him some question of, to the authors. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so oh, for sorry. for Li Li Xing, I want I was wondering uh, why you are using the black box testing. Is it uh, is it means it is difficult to collect the coverage information in the wrong time? And the second question that is, what is the testing oracle in your approach? You have some assertion or you are using the test uh, differential testing or something. And the third one for your approach is why you are using the generation based approach to generate a new test. Uh, what is the reason you are not using the mutation based uh, approach to generate your test is that means it is hard to collect a uh, seed for you yes uh, first our work is based on combinatorial testing we want to uh, we, uh, just, we want to uh, test the rest of API if uh, the faults or the bugs are caused by one or two uh, two parameters in the in the rest for API input parameters and uh, um, what is that what is the what is the other question uh, the other one is what is the testing oracle in your approach you have some uh, assertion or you are uh, using differential testing a uh, RESTful API, that means the source code is not accessible to uh, the user. It's usually uh, is deployed on a remote service. So we cannot get the source code of the RESTful API. So we try to use black box testing method to solve it. And the Oracle of testing RESTful API, uh, we have HTTP status code and the messages we get when we uh, send a request to the remote service we got. Okay, thank you. I think I will leave the time for the rest of questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for, for those questions and thanks for your answers. Um, How Lee has a question in oh, the chat. Yes, yes, let me answer it. So okay. for the first question is uh, Pe uh, Peleo's question. So he, he, he asked me how, my, how was my data set collected? Was my data set collected manually? So 
we for the we do experiments for open source projects for Java, both Java and Python. For Java pro, uh, Java projects, uh, we use the all the we we use the same projects as uh, used in prior work on on flaky tests, namely uh, mostly from uh, ID Flaky's data set, which is a flaky data set about uh, order dependent flaky tests. And for the Python one, we you adopt uh, we use the uh, recent work uh, about uh, on empirical in study of flaky tests that paper, and we use all their we use all the projects which had at least one flaky test. So it's it's we so we always use existing data sets uh, to reuse their reuse prior data set. So we use those projects and apply our technique and we find non-item potent tests and we have also open sourced our our findings, namely the data set. So, and the other question is from, yes. And the other question is from Hao Li and he asked me, there could be some tests that fails when running multiple times. Yes, that's, that's, that's right. And actually, uh, it, in our, uh, we didn't write it in the paper, but we do did do the experiment for ten times. We we like run the test ten times, and we find out some tests can fail like three uh two times later. Like it, it fails in the uh in some so after t running twice, they pass pass, but then they fail. It, it happens, but it's really rare, and it's possible we can find them. So yeah, it's definitely possible we can find them. So you just you just want to run three times, four times, or maybe uh, more, you, you can find them. Um, and in, in terms of monitoring the states and f monitoring the state of the program to find latent polluters, um, that's, uh, yeah, prior work has done something like that. And they propose some dynamic uh, taint analysis approach to find polluters. Um, so if, if you're interested, we can, we can talk more offline. Great, thank you. I have one question. Uh, Please go ahead. For, yeah, I have a question for Li Xin Shu. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, when you are extracting those constraints for the input parameters, there is like an open field where developers can just write, uh, as you said, uh, and you, you use the pattern-based approach. I was just wondering, uh, did you evaluate or check how this performs? If you can actually, if you can, uh, if you if you can actually identify what we what do you want, or if you looked at other techniques like name identity recognition, which are more generalizable, since you might have different ways of making these of having these specifications. Okay. Thanks for the question. Um, when we deal, deal with uh, input parameters constraints, we rely on an existing catalog of input parameters and dependency. Uh, in a previous paper, which summarized seven types of constraints from uh, several real-world RATFL APIs and uh, provides the most frequently used uh, ling linguistic structure, uh, structures from each type. We manually create a set of 23 patterns of constraints of, uh, between input parameters. So uh, if we use, uh, if uh, in our future work, we want to use some other uh, NLP language, like uh, try to learn the constraints during the testing process uh, is our future work. And uh, uh, in my following paper, I want to deal with this question. Great, thank That's you. All. Yeah, thank you both. So I have a question for Marcos. Um, in your talk, you mentioned that um, you did some work to integrate your technique or, or whatever into some of the tooling of your partner, um, yes. the company that you're partnering with in this research. Um, I'm wondering if there's more you want to say about what that experience has been like for your for your partner 
I'm kind of interested if you if you have um, have feedback that's sort of given you some some uh, you know you've learned some valuable things about the technique and, and how it's worked for them or anything more you could say about that I'd love to hear about it. yes sure um, so the first the first thing that uh, I'd like to say is that uh, one next step that I want to have is to kind of have include a kind of automatic feedback in the tool so basically collect uh, if people are actually using it and accepting the recommendations or not to have this feedback automatically instead of going to them and talk to them so we want to have this uh, to have this stream this feedback automatically but uh, in terms of usage uh what i noticed that is that uh they are more resistant with lower level recommendations such as to improve the terminology because that that will give a longer term benefit uh because they want to automate everything in the future so uh basically what this will help with is to have a more consistent uh, and avoid redundancy in the description so that they can use further NLP or build autonomous agents. So that's the main goal. But they are more resistant because I think there is no short term benefit that they can see right away. Uh, in, in contrast, they are more open to suggestions like the, the third module, which is the similarity one, because uh, it helps them at the time to avoid inserting duplicates, for example, or like very similar test cases and increasing increasing the the, the test suite is necessarily right so the lesson that i that i learned mostly was this so if they can see the benefit like in a shorter term they are more open to actually use it more actively in contrast if it's a longer term that they don't see right now they're a little bit more resistant yeah, yeah interesting yeah yeah cool well thank you thanks, thanks for, for the that passion. We probably have time for uh, maybe one last question or possibly two, if anyone has has any questions that they're wanting to ask. Uh, yes, I have a question for JVM testing. So your I think the idea of using a history bar commit as a, so this idea is generalizable to other domains uh, besides JVM testing, right? So yeah. have you ever thought about using the default 4J Bar, a bug benchmark to to evaluate your idea. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good choice to use the existing uh, bugs. But but I but the, the question is the defense for J are not designed for JVMs. Uh, so we think that the historical uh, JVM bug revealing test test progress are more effective in the uh, uh, detecting new bugs. So, but but we can try in the future uh, by so, using these uh, data sets. So why why what's the intuition that your idea applies very well in JVM? But I think it should be generalized. Like if you want to test compiler, I think previous compiler bugs also helps. Yeah, it, we, it should we, be generalizable, we, right? Yeah, we we have works on um, compilers uh, using this. Uh, this techniques and uh, uh, the question is uh, in the new testing scenario we can't we it's not easy to collect a lot of uh, bug revealing test programs uh, but uh, the the, the exp experiments on our new work on a uh, new compiler uh, shows that uh, the, uh, uh, using this uh, historical bug revealing test programs can help to Detect new bugs. I think the, the idea behind this is like more like uh, machine learning. So we uh, learn knowledge from the history data and apply in, apply them into a new context, uh, then to trigger new, then to find new bugs. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I hope hope I answer your yes. question. Yes. Thanks for the answer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Any last short questions? Okay, well, thank you very much to all of you for being here for the presenters, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you thank for checking these sections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Welcome. Bye bye.